unhide, and let me hide. Now, a, a more simple one, thankfully. I've now decided I want to simply, inst uh, I want to divide my patient population into either pediatric, adult, or geriatric. And on what basis am I doing this? Well, I'm going to go, literally, this, this exercise that you see in front of me, uh, in front of you, came, uh, came from uh, one of my clients who's a nurse. And um, I said to her, well, what do you mean by pediatric? And for her, she said, well, in this hospital, even though technically 17 and 18 year olds, uh, six, uh, six, 17 year olds would be considered pediatric, we literally put them on an adult unit. So that's the way, so in her, in her book, 16 and 17 year olds were adults. So what I've done here is I've said, if D2, the patient's age, is less than 16, that is to say it's between zero and 15, we're gonna call the patient pediatric. Otherwise, if the patient is less than 65, we're gonna call them an adult. Otherwise, if they don't fit into either of these first two conditions, we're gonna call them geriatric. So let's suppose I go here and I go into this first patient, Edgar Brown, and let's suppose, oops, I made a an error. He was not born on January 30th, 2002. He was really born on, a, on January 30th, 1932. So now, all of a sudden, watch what happens. When I change his date of birth, his age will change, and the, the uh, text that he, uh, the category he fell into will change. I hit my enter, and he went from pediatric to geriatric. Why? Because I changed his date of birth. Very important. The if statement is great. The if statement is one of the most useful tools in all of Microsoft Excel. Um, the if statement can really help you to, when you have data that's very scattered, it can help you put some structure on the data and put the data in a way, uh, arrange the data in some logical cohorts and logical groups that allow you to uh, I indicate a, a, few, um, a few different conditions. I'm going to show you one more, and then we're going to take some questions. I'd like to uh, get to, um, uh, well, at least two more, and then we'll get to some questions. I want to show you the AND logic. The AND logic is a little bit more complicated, but it is certainly doable. Let's suppose I want to look at a condition where I want to look at those patients who have, who are over the age of 64 and have a length of stay greater than three days. Well, look at my formula up here on the formula bar. I say equals and, open paren, age, D2, is greater than 64, comma, I2, length of stay, is greater than three. So when I put this formula in, it then tells me that my length of stay for this patient, for patient Victor Brown, his length of stay, the combination of his length of stay and his age was not, uh, did, did not meet that criteria. It's false. But here I have a patient, look at this patient, Patricia Collins. There she is, she's 71, her length of stay is six days, true. So the and statement allows you to link together certain logical criteria and you can then have, well, the, in, you can link them through the and statement and the way you read it is you say equals and this condition, first condition, and then second condition. You can put them together and create, I believe it's up to 16 levels of and. I'm not sure, I'll, I'll have to check, <clears throat> excuse me, on how many levels of the and logic you're able to, to do. I have people here waving at me and telling me that there are questions out there. I'm gonna show one more example, I'm gonna skip over questions 13 and 14, exact, excuse me, exercises 13 and 14. We'll try to, to come back to them if time allows, but I want to show you one last thing. What do we do with invalid data? Let's suppose here, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. Let's suppose here in my surgeon list, I'm validating against uh, a, a list that I've, I've put up. I've, I've taken this data and I, let's say I brought it in from some other source. And now I want to go in and I want to validate against this table. Remember, I didn't put this in. This came maybe from my HIS or from my um, surgical system or whatever. And I know that, this, that, that my list of surgeons here may not necessarily equal my list of surgeons here. 
because I imported this from some other source. Watch this. You're going to like this. I now see, oh, I've got a doctor here, Dr. Smalls, Mary Smalls. It allowed her to come in because I imported this file, but she's not on this list. Lo and behold, where's Dr. Smalls? Well, what do I do? I go over here. And in my validation, I click on data, validation, circle invalid data. Do you see that? Data valid, whoops, excuse me. Data, validation, circle invalid data. And look what it does. It highlights to me, for me, and it tells me, uh-oh, I better add Dr. Smalls to my master list over here. So I can add her down here, Smalls, Mary. But now I still got an error. Why do I have an error? Because this cell here, N16, is not part of my data validation table. So I've got to go back to my data validation table. I've got to go over here and I've got to reset my data validation. I go to data validation. I now say my settings. Look at that. Ah, it only goes to N15. I need to extend it down to N16. And now I click OK, and my circles go away. So I hope that, uh, before we take any questions, I just want to, to summarize, I hope that you are walking away today with an increased understanding of the data validation tool. Um, in future seminars, we will be coming back to this topic. I urge you to try this on some of your data, set up some lookup tables that are uh, simple, some data that you know cold, it doesn't need to be overly complicated. And when you uh, then uh, have your, your data uh, lookup table set up, you're welcome to uh, send me any questions. You're even welcome to send me spreadsheets. Please don't send me anything with any real live uh, provider or patient information on it, um, but uh, make up some data. I'd be happy to take a look at it and critique it. Um, I, since I anticipate that some of the questions will be of a common nature, I will probably create a document that uh, addresses uh, those, those, those rather than uh, addressing the same uh, question multiple times. I've got a question here, and the question is, is there a resource for the formula templates? Yes, there are. There are many resources for the formula templates. Um, certainly, you can go out onto Google and find uh, some there. Um, I found one, uh, I believe it's called MrExcel.com. Um, what I'll do is I'll create a list uh, with a bunch of URLs that have um, some, uh, some template, uh, some resources for templates. Uh, Microsoft, uh, the help screens in Microsoft are okay. Are they great? No, they're not great because Microsoft is great at developing software. They're not so great at uh, writing a documentation. Uh, but, there are, but if you go out to Google and type uh, formula templates, uh, you can get some there. We will put together uh, some simple ones as well. I've got another question that says, can you hide the small box with your input message in it? seems to be getting in the way of the drop down and after a few entries you wouldn't need it. I agree. Yes, I'm not crazy about those input messages. Um, yes, you can do that. You can't hide it. What you would have to do is you would have to actually set up two uh, separate um, data validations, one that displays it and one that doesn't. I, I uh, am tempted to um, dispense with that and just simply dis uh, display an error message. You don't remember. You don't have to display that those those messages. And I do find, as as the uh, person questioning uh, also does, uh, did find uh, that they get in the way visually. I I agree. Another question: Since you never know exactly how much data will be entered, can you select an entire column and then do data validation? Yes, you absolutely can do uh, data validation on an, on the entire column. Um, I, I'm doing that here. Uh, I'm, I'm only using a range of data um, in, in the exercises here, but there's nothing to prevent you from going like this, clicking on, as I've done in column E, and say data validation, allow list, or allow whatever you, you want to do. You do risk um, gobbling up a bit more memory, and so if you're short on memory, um, sometimes the data will be a little bit more complex. One of the things you want to remember, and I tell all the people who, whether they've taken one course with me or they've taken 10 courses with me, the most important principle in doing good data analysis in Microsoft Excel is exactly where we began. 
no blank columns, no blank rows. If you do that, if you have, when, you're, when you set up your database, if you have no blank columns and no blank rows, you inevitably will have a much better chance of getting the, the result that you want when you're actually doing your data analysis. Later on, when you want to make it nice and pretty to send to the CFO or to send to the VP of administration, you can put in whatever you want. But when you're doing your data analysis, you need to make sure no blank columns, no blank rows. Um, I'd like to um, uh, turn the agenda over to uh, my colleagues. And uh, I want to thank you for coming. And I look forward to hearing from all of you. Wow, Mike. Thank you so much. That was really an excellent presentation. I, I have learned a lot of things today myself about the use of Excel, uh, things that I didn't know about. So that was very, very helpful. And I really um, I hope that you all can join me on the other two webinars in the future, because if this is just the beginning. We've got a lot more to learn. Um, I do have some specific questions about uh, our program here at SPS. Uh, first question I had was, is the RHIA credential important for getting jobs, and what do I have to do to take the exam? Well, it is um, important in the field of HIM to have that RHIA credential. It um, it uh, it shows what your knowledge is, uh, what your knowledge is as you're graduating from a program. And um, if you go out and do a search on some of the job websites, you will find that there's jobs specifically for our, those with an RHIA credential. It is very important. Um, in order to get the RHIA credential, however, there is only one way to do it, and that is to get a baccalaureate um, in um, health information management. That's the only uh, entry level to take the, the exam. There is no other way to get it. You have to go through a baccalaureate program. Some sc schools do have a uh, post-baccalaureate certificate program. And yes, uh, somebody asked, is the program fully online? Yes. It is fully online with the exception of one professional practice experience course, which is at the end of the program, um, where a student must go out and do um, some hours in a facility or in their um, whatever type of position they're interested in once they graduate. And we will help set that up and get the student placed in, um, in that experience. Um, we do have a list of classes by all semester. Well, we really don't have a list of classes by all semester because we have been offering now all classes all semesters. We do have a large number of courses that we are offering this coming summer. And we will be offering our, um, comp our full complement of courses uh, in the fall and in the spring. Um, students can start the program in this coming summer. Uh, if you apply now, technically you'll be part of the cohort that, that starts in the fall, but we do have a, cor a lot of courses offered this coming summer, so that is still a possibility if you are interested. As far as accreditation is concerned, our HIM program is in candidacy with KHIM. We're in the process of getting all our documentation set up and sent in to KHIM so that they could come here for a site visit and um, examine our program. The important thing with accreditation is that the, the program you graduate from must be accredited in order for you to sit for the RHIA exam. So if you're starting this summer, for instance, um, probably have a couple of semesters that at least you're going to need to do courses for. So by the time your coursework is done, we should be accredited. And uh, what if we have an associate degree in HIT? What do I have left to do? Uh, that will depend on what, what program you're coming from. We would evaluate your transcript to see what courses transfer directly into our courses. But we do have a fair number of, of courses that will transfer directly in from HIT programs. And one more question about tuition. Our tuition here is $245 per credit or $745 for a three credit course. And um, if, you have, if anybody has any additional questions, please feel free to contact me um, on the, um, at the contact information that I had in the presentation. There, my email address is there, or my phone number in my office, or my cell phone number. Please feel free to contact me, any and all of those methods. You could also visit our website if you're interested in applying. Um, 
directly to the website and it has information about what requirements are for an application. I really appreciate you attending today. Thank you very much. I hope to see you again in oh, May 21st is our next is our next meet, uh, webinar and then June 18th.